Okay, so my name is Mario Waits, and I will be your professor on international economics. Uh, let's introduce my CV. Well, I am originally from Argentina, Buenos Aires, but I left Argentina a long time ago, and I studied in the United States, a PhD at American University in Washington. Then I worked for the World Bank in Washington for several years in the International Monetary Fund as executive director member, representing Argentina, Bolivia, Uruguay, Paraguay, Peru, and Chile in the board. Uh, not during Rodrigo Rato, but before, long time ago. I work in investment banks. I went back to Argentina. I was advisor of the Minister of Finance. This was before the Corralito, because Corralito was a disaster. And then uh, I have been director of the railway company, Renfe of Argentina, a public company. And uh, right now I work in a, basically, I have a company, Consulta Abierta, and we teach uh, basically people from banks, international banks, multinational companies on foreign trade, finance, as well as, of course, economic matters. And we work a lot for the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, advising them, and also with private banking. So if you have some money, some dinerillo, <laughs> two euro, 2,000 uh, million euros, I can advise you in the coffee break uh, where to invest, bonds, <coughs> stocks, because my work is to advise brokers of Banif, uh, WBA, different banks, where to put the money in the ratio of the clients. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first topic would be international economics, so I will give you the impression that we have in the World Bank about the world. And let me begin by dividing the world in two parts, rich industrial countries and developing countries. On the rich countries, we have the Troika, three superpowers, USA, Japan, and Euroland, Europe we call Euroland, Eurolandia. And those are the rich countries that are the big superpowers in the world. Later, we are doing some exercise, and I will ask you about the future of superpowers, because we are changing the superpowers in the world. So basically, right now we have three, but in the future we will have more. And then we will discuss what will be the new superpowers. So this would be industrial countries. And on the other hand, we have developing countries. And in developing countries, we have four regions, areas. Number one, Latin America, we call in Spain LATAM, Latin American countries. Second, Asian countries. Third, African countries. And finally, Eastern European countries. Those are considered developing countries. In the last 10 years, we are changing the power between developing and rich. Let me give you an example. Only 10 years ago, 61% of total GDP, total richness, has been in rich countries, and 39% in developing, 10 years ago. Right now, we have 50-50, half and half. Basically, 50% is in rich, 50% of GDP uh, in developing. And we expect in the World Bank that in 10 years would be 61% in developing and 39% in rich. Therefore, we are having a lot of changes. And given the fact that the only solution for Spain in the medium term would be to export, basically we feel in the World Bank, I will talk about Spain later, but right now we have problems, as you know, and we need to spend a lot of time before the economy is doing well. Unemployment is very high, and unless economic growth would be minimum 2%, unemployment will remain very, very high. And the basics for improving the economy is encouraging exports and tourism. This is why your sector, tourism, would be essential because th this would be one of the bases, the motors of the future. This is why I advise my students first to have a good marriage, looking for a wife with money. <laughs> this is my first advice. And second is having a master, but in English. Why? Because the future for the Spanish economy is to export, to go abroad, or even if you work in a Spanish company, to make business abroad. In my case, for example, my company makes most of the business in England. So I teach my students that uh, if you don't want to change your wife or your husband, <laughs> I assume that this is your case, plan B would be a master and also English. So you are in a very good position for the future to do so. OK, so on the, let's begin by uh, explaining uh, what will happen in developing countries. So I will divide the conference in two parts. First, I will begin by developing, and then I move to rich countries, mainly USA, Japan, and uh, Europe. So in developing countries, basically, we have four re regions. So my, my, I have a question to you, volunteers. W on the four regions, Asia, Latin America, 
Eastern European Africa, what is the region, in your feelings, your opinion, that would be better in economic terms, economic growth, more economic growth in the future? What of the four regions would be number one in having economic growth? What? Eastern Europe? No. We have one even more. Asia. I mean, in Asia, economic growth would be 7%. Second region would be Latin America, expected growth 5%. I am commenting the last numbers of the IMF and the World Bank recently. Then Africa, and finally Eastern European. So let me explain why this would be the ranking. First Asia, Latin America, Africa, Eastern European. Let's begin by Asia. In Asia, we are expecting economic growth 7%, which is very high, very good. And first country, which is, will be, do very well, China. China, we are very optimistic in the World Bank. By the way, one, one of the topics that in your sector, tourism, they are studying a lot is the possibility that a lot of Chinese are coming to Spain as a tourist. For example, as an anecdote, I live in Las Rozas, and in Las Rozas there is a shopping village. I, I suppose that the ladies know about this. <laughs> and uh, I have been noting that we have a lot of, uh, you see, signals in Chinese. And talking with the people, well, Mario, thanks to the Chinese visitors, we are selling a lot of things because rich Chinese, one million very rich people are buying in Spain. So some of the students of the masters are selecting as a topic of the th thesis this idea, Chinese visiting Spain and how we organize tourism packages, two weeks, all the things for the Chinese. This is a new topic that a lot of students in the masters are preparing. And in your sector, of course, tourists would be a very interesting topic to research and make some, some studies. So China, we are very optimistic. Economic growth would be around 7%. And basically, uh, the reason is that they are moving from communist to capitalist world in economic terms. In terms of political behavior, they continue to be only one party, communist party. But they are opening the economy. And we are very optimistic that in the future, they will grow 7%. Second country would be India. India will grow around 6%, very good also, and this would be the second superpower. As you know, in terms of population, population of China is 1.3 billion, China, and India 1.1 billion. So if we will put together China and India, Chindia, which is the addition, is a very important proportion. Remember that total population in the world is 7 uh, thousand mil billion, so basically it's a big part of total population. But given the fact that in India people have more babies than in China, we are expecting that in only 35 years population of India will be number one and China number two. So we are changing the, the, the proportion because in China, as you know, most of the people have only one baby, while in India three. So in a few years, 35, we expect in demographic trends a change on this. Okay, so after China and India, the tigers of Asia. Tigers are countries located in the southest part of Asia, such as Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, uh, Thai, uh, uh, Vietnam. Those countries, we call them tigers. Why? Because they enjoy huge economic growth during the 70s and 80s, 7%. This we call them strong animals, tigers. And let me point out Singapore. In the World Bank, we prepare a ranking. We call the ranking doing business in the world. So if you want to put a company in a country, what are the steps that you should uh, pursue? And what are the best countries to make business? And Singapore is the first number one in the world in encouraging making business. For example, if you want to open a company, the expected average duration is one day. No bureaucratic. In one day, you create a company, low taxation, and so on. So Singapore is a very interesting country to make business, but all the tigers, basically Malaysia, Korea, those countries will do very well. So after Asia, we have Latin America. And in Latin America, we in the World Bank, we like five countries by order. Do you imagine what will be number one in terms of making business in Latin America? Brazil, exactly. Basically, Brazil, only a few years ago, 20 years ago, inflation was... 2,000% before Lula. When President Cardoso took power just a few years ago, 20, 
inflation in Brazil was 2,000%. Right now, Brazil is doing very well, having a huge economic growth, 4 or 5%, encouraging capital inflows, and in terms of investing in Brazil, Telefónica, Banco Santander, a lot of companies are making a lot of business. So Brazil is number one. Number two, Chile, Chile good. Basically, Chile, even though it's a small country, it's open economy, good managerial skills, uh, low tariffs. If you want to export, you don't pay tariffs. So Chile is number two. Number three, Mexico. Mexico. Uh, Mexico is not so good today because of the problems with the narcos and also because they depend <coughs> heavily on USA. For example, Mexico exports around 85% of total exports to USA. Therefore, uh, if the American economy is not doing well, Mexico will suffer. This is why we economists prefer diversification. Don't depend on a market or a product, but try to make a diversification. So we have the remaining two. We call them the hidden or tapados in Spanish. What are the two remaining countries in Latin America that are very interesting to make business? Argentina, no. Venezuela, no. <laughs> Colombia, good. And number five, Peru. Yeah, we call them the hidden or tapados because they don't, we don't speak a lot about them, but they are doing very well, and there are a lot of Spanish companies making business. Argentina, no. Argentina, especially because after the Corralito, uh, in Spain, most of the companies are reluctant to invest. You, saw, you remember the Corralito, 10 years ago, a lot of Argentinians lost part of the deposits of the banks. GEP, the, the, the economic growth has been going down. And then the Argentinian government, 10 years ago, after the Corralito, decide a unilateral default. They didn't pay the external debt. Therefore, foreign investors have been suffering losses. Therefore, they don't want to invest in Argentina. Even though Argentina is growing 8%, like China, in Spain there are mixed feelings because they don't have legal stability in Argentina and they have concerns about nationalization and so that. And finally, because of political reasons, what are the four countries that are not very interesting because of the politics of the, of the countries? Venezuela, Bolivia. Bolivia, Ecuador, well, Cuba and Nicaragua, five countries. So basically, Latin America is doing very well as a region, but with some uh, division of countries. Some of the countries are doing well, others are not. Okay, after that, we have Africa. You say, Mario, Africa, <coughs> their poverty is very high, it's true. But in Africa, what is the main export of Africa? Africa are exporting what, basically? Yeah, basically, raw materials, commodities mainly minerals and food. As you know, in the world, there are two regions that are very rich in raw materials, commodities, Latin America and Africa. Basically, they export gold, copper, minerals, not diamonds. And as you know, in the last years, the prices of international commodities has been going up sharply. Why? Because of the demand from India and China. Therefore, if Nigeria is exporting oil or South Africa diamonds, and international prices are going up, they are rich. Because in order to calculate exports, you need to multiply the volume, the quantity, which is equal, multiplied by the price. But if the price is going up because the Chinese are buying and demand is going up, you have more money. And this is the reason why African countries are doing very well. And finally, Eastern Europeans is the, the, the last position. Well, we like very much Poland to make business. Uh, Poland is enjoying good economic growth. It's the only big country in Eastern European. The rest are very small. And they receive a lot of money from the European Commission. Basically, Poland, they receive a lot of money. Therefore, they are doing uh, very well. But in other countries, such as Hungary, for example, if you read the media this, uh, this week, the newspapers, Hungary, they have problems, like Greece. So in some of Eastern European countries, they have difficulties. The reason is that foreign investors are taking away money from Eastern European to put the money in China, India, and Brazil, in which they have more profits. And also remember that Eastern European countries depend heavily on Germany, because Germany is the main exporter. And right now, Germany will grow zero this year, because Germany was doing well. But this year, expectations are uh, zero economic growth. Therefore, Eastern Europeans are in the last position. But in, in talking about the group, developing countries will do very well. So in the future, my feeling is that Spain 
will base the economic strategy in exporting, but not to Germany or to the United States, but to China, India, and Latin America. As you know, right now we are exporting to Germany, France, and Portugal. But in the future, given the fact that in Europe the situation is very bad and economic growth will be zero, if the countries are not growing, they don't need to import. So we are not being able to export. While China, India, Latin America will have economic growth, therefore we have a lot of opportunities to make business in these uh, countries. Okay, the second point before moving to the rich countries is why developing countries are doing well. And the World Bank, we think that there are four reasons why they are doing very well. Number one is that they didn't have the problem of the international financing crisis. As you know, the origins of the international financial crisis has been United States, the mortgage housing market. Uh, what happened in the United States? Basically, they have a reduction in the price of housing, and this creates a lot of problems in the bonds. Then, when I explain the situation of USA, I will make a summary. What happened with the finance that creates this problem of Lehman Brothers, all the crisis that we are suffering. But the banks in Latin America, Asia, are commercial banks. They don't have investment banks. And the problem has been with investment banks that invest in these bonds associated with the mortgages. For example, in Spain also, Banco Santander, BBVA, 95% of the profits is commercial and only 5% investments. So the problem of Spain is not the subprime bonds, but the surprise. What is the surprise? <laughs> Sorpresa. <laughs> Ladrillo, basically the housing. The problem of the banks is basically that they have a lot of, you see, <coughs> mortgages and people are, cannot pay and the price of or see, all the property will go down. Uh, today we will discuss later what are the expectations for the price of the, of the housing, but the tendency is to go down. Therefore, you have a lot of liabilities, losses, if you have an asset in which you have a depreciation for the future. So one of the uh, advantages, pros of developing countries is the fact that they don't have any uh, investment banks. Therefore, the financial crisis for them was zero, not very important. While in United States, England, Japan, Germany, France, Given the fact that the main business of the banks is investment banks, they have a lot of losses. So this is reason number one why developing countries are doing better. Reason number two, what is the main export of developing countries? Raw material commodities, mainly two, uh, food and also minerals. And in the last 10 years, as you know, prices will go up. It's like having the Euro Mission, a lottery, mm -hmm. because they get a lot of money given the fact that they are exporting assets in which the price is going up. How is the process by which developing countries are benefiting from this? Let's suppose, for example, that Chile, what, by the way, what is the main export of Chile? In Spanish or English, it doesn't matter. Copper, cobre. So basically, if the price of copper is going up, or cereals, Argentina, or oil, Venezuela, or Mexico, or banana, Central America, if the prices are going up, they are exporting the same quantity, okay, but the price is going up. Therefore, if you multiply quantity by, by, uh, by price, you get more money. If exports are going up, economic growth is going up. Because as you know from macro, economic growth is based on four sources. Consumption, investment, public sector expenditures, and exports. So if you have the same consumption, investment, and expenditures, but your exports are going up because the prices are going up, you have more economic growth. Also, you have not only more exports and economic growth, but also uh, you have, in addition to these uh, things, uh, more income to spend because who is the owner of the oil in Venezuela and Mexico? The government. Therefore, if the price of oil is going up, they have more money to, to have revenues to spend in social programs. And even if the owners are private, like in Argentina, the cereals, when the price of soja cereals are going up, half of the money is going to the government because the government is increasing taxes, retenciones. So part of the money is going to the producers, private producers, but the government is having money, and with this money, we have money to, to, to spend. This is why one of the jokes about Argentina, why Argentina is, is doing so well, uh, soja, 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 cereals. I mean, the Euromillon, the lottery, if the price is going up, of course, we are rich. Okay, so this is sector, uh, second factor, which is very important. Th the third factor is that we should give some credits to Latin American governments. They are doing very well the homework. Right now the situation is good. Why? Because in Latin America, you remember that we have the lost decade, década perdida, during the 80s. Th these years, 
Latin America have been suffering external debt, hyperinflation, international monetary fund gave loans, and really GDP was going down. Uh, another example of lost decade is Japan during the 90s, and in Spain, right now we are talking about the future, because we have four years of crisis, and in the future, I am pessimistic, by the way, about Spain, we can have at least four, five more years of low economic growth. Remember that in Spain the situation is bad because we have a combination of factors, internal and international. Uh, later I will talk about the Spanish situation. But we're expecting that a lot of Spanish are moving to look for jobs abroad, mainly Germany and Latin America and China. I have a lot of students, engineers, by the way, that uh, they study German and they are going to Germany or to Latin America. Uh, so this is why uh, the situation in Spain really will not be very good. This is why it's very important to have a master Formation is very important, and in English, sub, having some level of English is important because it is, it is estimated that more than 65% of the jobs would be in English or having some requirements. This is why it's important to have not only the master, but also some language abilities. Okay, so in the case of uh, Latin America, the third reason is that they make the homework. For example, right now, Inflation is very low in Latin America, with the exception of what is, are the only two or three countries in Latin America with high inflation right now. Argentina, Venezuela, but most of the countries have low inflation, 6%, 7%, given the fact that during the 80s inflation in Latin America was 300%, 400% hyperinflation. Right now, fiscal deficit. Fiscal deficit is the difference between expanded to minus revenues is very low, so they don't have a lot of debts. External debt is very low because they are not borrowing money from international banks, while in Spain, external debt is very high. For example, analyzing the country risk analysis, the ratio between external debt over GDP shouldn't exceed 41%. External debt shouldn't be more than 41% if the country is doing well. In Latin America, all the countries have good numbers. Do you know, by the way, in Spain, what is the external debt? 161% of GDP. Why? In the last 20 years, we have a fiesta party pachanga. We live better than we should produce. For example, in Las Rozas, all my neighbors, they have two cars, Ferrari, BMW. And uh, they are employees, they are not a video thing. So we live uh, better than we should produce. And we borrow money from the banks and savings banks, Caja de Ahorro. And Spanish banks borrow money from German, French, and American banks. And right now, we need to repay the external debt. This is why, right now, the situation in Latin America is very good and in Europe is very bad, because we have a lot of debts, <coughs> internal, external, fiscal deficit, while Latin Americans, they have good public finance. So we should deserve some credit to the governments that are implementing good economic policies. And finally, the last reason why developing countries are doing very well has to do with the fact that interest rates and um, economic growth is very low in Europe in Japan and in the United States. In the United States, interest rates are zero. In Europe, 1%. In Japan, 0.25%. So all the investors, the foreign investors, are taking the money away from low profitability and investing in China, India, and Brazil, in which interest rates and economic growth is better. So you expect more profitability. Yeah, for example, if you are private bank investors, most of the private investors are taking away the money from stocks in Spain and investing in developing countries. So therefore, the conclusion is that developing countries are doing very well, and we expect in the World Bank that in the coming 10 years, developing countries will do even, even better. So this is the first topic of the international economy. Let's move to rich countries, and I will talk briefly about three superpowers. Number one, USA. Number two, Europe. Uh, not Spain, because Spain I will speak later. And <laughs> Yeah, Spain is a special, special chapter, and we, I need to talk a lot about this, but I, I warn you that I am pessimistic about Spain, because this combination is not very good. Unemployment is how much in Spain? 23%, 20, close to 23%. The average unemployment in Europe is 9%. Uh, economic growth this year would be negative, recession, minus 1%, perhaps. Then fiscal deficit, the difference between expenditures and revenues, 8% of GDP, while the maximum is no more than 3 for the economy to be strong. So we spend a lot of money, so we need to reduce <coughs> expenditures and collect more taxes. What else? On the other factors, external debt 
is 161% of GDP, while the maximum shouldn't exceed 40%. So, and why we don't have a revolution in Spain, like in Tunisia or Egypt? We are Pacific. Well, it's a, it's a good argument. But in addition to the Pacific, there are three arguments, according with the sociologists of the World Bank, why we don't have a revolution. Number one, the black underground economy. In Spain, according with the World Bank, we have at least 23% of the, of the uh, GDP on black economy. Uh, the ranking is the following. Italy, the champion, 25% of GDP, underground economy. Spain, the vice champion, 23% of GDP. Greece and Portugal, 22% of GDP, the underground economy. Uh, Germany and France, 9% of GDP. Scandinavians, which are very strange, by the way, only 2% of GDP. So having black economy underground is good or bad? bad? Well, each time that an economist asks you a question, the answer is it depends. Unless I ask you about your name or your sex, but <laughs> generally speaking, uh, basically it depends. The negative uh, factor about underground economy is that they don't collect taxes. It's less money to education and health. And what is, in a way, the positive things about the black economy? A lot of people that are unemployed are working, making chapuzas in the world, in the, in the economy. And also, good point, consumption is going up. So it's one factor in which it, it avoids a revolution because on the five uh, million unemployed people, half of them are working in the, in the black economy. The second reason why, according with sociologists in Spain, we don't have a revolution yet, has to do with family ties. We are like Berlanga movies. We live with Papa and Mom until we are 31 and we move to close to our suegra when we, <laughs> we marriage. So basically it's like Berlanga movies, we have some exaggeration, but on the other hand, the good thing about um, uh, this is that if you, uh, if you have a problem of unemployment, you lose your job, your family is helping you. So this is why family ties is very important. And number three is the good relations from the for former government or with the labor unions, because usually they have good relations, they have only one general strike, with the social situation, so this implies. But in the future, what is the problem? In Spain, if you lost your job, unemployment insurance is only, duration is two years. But given the fact that we are expecting that in the future, unemployment will remain high, in a few years, we have five million people without any income. This is why it is very important for the new government to encourage economic growth, because if not, we will have really a, a very bad situation. Okay, so let's move to rich countries. I will begin by talking about USA, then I will move to Europe, and finally to Japan. Okay, so let's begin with the United States. Well, the situation of the United States is very bad, really. Uh, in Europe, it's even worse, but in the United States, it's not very good. Let me explain why. First, they have the financial crisis after Lehman Brothers. Let me explain what happened with the financial crisis. For example, in Spain, if you buy a house, a mortgage, and if you stop paying the mortgage, what happened to you? First, the bank is taking your home, uh, your, your, your house, but also you need to pay to the bank more money because it is the legal contract. So in Spain, it's not a very good idea to stop paying the mortgage because you need to pay more. But in the United States and in England, the Anglo world, they have a different legal system. If you stop paying, you just are losing your house, but you don't pay any more to the bank. Therefore, you have incentives if the price of housing is going down to give the key to the bank and all the losses will go to the bank. It's like if you have been renting a few years and then you give. So this is a very important reason why in the United States we have 4 million families that have been given the keys to the, the banks. The banks thought that because of God, it has been impossible for the price of housing to go down. So they make a mistake. They give loans to the clients. According with finance theory, you shouldn't, as a bank, give more than 81, 82% of the capital to take some risk. But the banks in Spain and in the United States gave 120%. All the capital, taxation, notary, and travel for Europe because you deserve it. So basically, it has been really very irresponsible. So what happened in the United States? All the banks gave well, there are two kinds of loans in the United States. The loans like Spain, you need to have a job, some <laughs> documents to get the, the mortgage. But there are four million people, the ninjas, no job, no asset, no income. People from, you see Hispanic, you see people with low 
o sea, you see, in the United States there are discrimination about some sectors. Most of the people with lower education, basically they borrow money. And the banks give loans to these ninjas. And the problem was that when the price of housing in the United States were going down, all these four million people give the key to the banks, and then in the secondary markets, the bonds associated with these loans has been going down. Let me explain in a very easy way, because this is a technical discussion. Before globalization, when a bank gave a loan to a client, all the risk was in the bank, because you put the loan in the balance sheet, and if the client is not paying to you, you have losses. But right now, because of the globalization changes, what the bank did was the following. I give a loan to you. If you don't, uh, base, but I, I will not keep the risk. I will move this uh, loan to a bond. I will transform this in a bond, and I will sell the bond to investment banks. So investment banks are buying these bonds, and then when the price of housing was going down, in the secondary market, this value was going down. This has been the reason why we have all the problem. The banks thought that it has been impossible for the price of housing to go down. And finally, we have four countries in which we have a bubble. What is a bubble in finance? It's an asset. It's going up and suddenly it's going down. What are the four countries, by the way, in the world that have, have, have been suffering a bubble in the property? Spain, Spain, Ireland, England, and United States. So this has been the reason. So you say, Mario, wait a second. If I am an investment bank broker, in order to buy the bond, I would like to be sure that the risk is zero. And this is the problem with the rating agencies. Do you know, did you read the press today? What happened? <coughs> All the markets are going down sharply because the rating agencies are downgraded the following countries. France, Spain to, to grades. Uh, well, with the exception of Germany and other countries, all were going down. And this is why the stocks are going down, the euro is going down strongly. Well, this has been yesterday. So the ratings are three entities, Moody's, Standard & Poor, and Fitch. And there are auditors. They need to give, you see, a, a, a grade to investors willing to buy bonds. The best grade is, do you know what is the best? 10 over 10? AAA, triple A. And the rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor, and Fitch, give to these bonds associated with the ninjas 10 over 10, triple A. Why? First, because who is paying to Moody's when it makes an evaluation of the, of the bond's quality? The bank or the company. It doesn't make any sense because if I am the auditor, I am controlling you, you, you have a company and you pay me, I have incentives to give you a good grade, so you give me more dinerizio, more money. So this is the, one of the reasons. It doesn't make any sense that the banks are financing the auditors. And the second reason is that these bonds have not been sold, uh, sold alone, but in a packages, boxes, with corporation bonds, such as Coca-Cola, IBM, good companies. So for the auditors from the, you see, Moody's people, it was difficult to see the risk. So in summary, I don't want to be very technical about this because it is, has uh, some financial things, but the summary is that putting together all the things, in the United States, we have the crisis, Lehman Brothers and so on, and they have difficulties. Given the fact that the banks in the United States, Citibank, Chase Bank, J.P. Morgan, they have a lot of investment banks, a lot of banks were going bankruptcy, and it was necessary for the government with tax money from the people, taxpayer money, to help the banks. In the United States, it's very unpopular to have, uh, help the banks. Why? Because people pay taxes religiously. I mean, they pay all the time. There is no evasion. Uh, so, for example, in the United States, when, if you are drinking a beer with a colleague of the work in the happy hour after 5 o'clock, and if you confess that you are not paying to Hacienda, tax authorities, there are two possibilities. You are not anymore my friend, or I call Hacienda, he's lying. In Spain, if you talk about a colleague, I am paying, you are tonto del pueblo. You are, I mean, you are basically, uh, how are you paying? Let me explain to you, chanchullos, how to avoid paying. So basically, so this is why the Americans, they don't want that with the taxpayer money to help Citibank. And they think, well, if the Citibank made mistakes in the risk, it's a problem of Citibank, but I will not pay. So this is why it has been difficult for Bush and Obama to convince Americans to, to pay. But they do so, and well, this has been necessary because if not, we have really a big problem. So after this crisis, the American economy has been suffering, and this is the reason why the situation is very bad. For example, another problem of United States is the lack of good relations between Obama 
and Republicans. It's very important, really, that have good relation between the government and the opposition. If we have consensus, the economic program is doing better. And one of the weaknesses that we are noting right now is the ability of political uh, leaders. We need a Churchill. You remember Winston Churchill. Basically, he was thinking in the long-term strategy. It doesn't matter if I lose elections. But right now, unfortunately, if we talk about all the leaders, Berlusconi, Zapatero, Obama, Angela Merkel, Sarkozy, whatever, they are thinking in the short term, winning elections tomorrow, but no one is thinking in the medium term. For example, in the United States, Obama is fight, uh, fighting with the Republicans. In the Republican Party, as you know, there is a group, which is a growing group, the Tea Party, that are very conservatives. Right now, one of the big problems of United States of America is that they have a huge fiscal deficit. They spend more money because of the military and so on, and they don't collect taxes. And this is 10% of GDP, very high. In Spain is 8, in the United States is 10. So financial markets want that they reduce. They reduce spending and they collect more taxes. Obama position is, well, in order to reduce, rich people will pay more. But the Republicans say, no, rich people shouldn't pay more, but you need to reduce expenditures. So my, my point is why we should do both, and we are doing better. But no, they are doing, you see, discussing, one, one, and they are doing nothing, and the situation of the American economy is having difficulties. So the uh, weak political leaders that we have is a big problem, also with the discussion between Germany and Greece. Of course, Germans consider that the Greeks are not doing the homework, and they need to sell the Acropolis, I mean, the monuments. <laughs> if you ask Germany, I mean, 85 of the Germans, according with the poll, say the solution is that the Greeks, they sell the Iceland, the Acropolis, because they need to pay and they are doing nothing. But the Germans should remember that this is the Titanic. Remember that during the Titanic, even people in the first class die. And the Germans will die also, because the German economy depends heavily on Europe. Uh, for example, let me give you an example. When Germany joined the euro 10 years ago, uh, exports in Germany represent only 25% of GDP, 25. Right now, in Germany, 62% of GDP are exports. So the basis of the economy are exports. And what is the distribution of exports? 65% are going to Europe. Therefore, if Europe is having a recession, Germany will have zero growth. Let me give you an example. Until now, Germany has been growing 4%. But this year, given the fact that Europe is having difficulties, they are growing zero. This is why, for them, it's good to give some money to the Greek for the European economies to improve. And the second point is the following. What are the banks, the nationality of the banks that gave loans to Greeks? Spanish? No. German and French. So, if Greece is having bankruptcy, Germany will have problems. Therefore, this is why they need to spend some money and convince them. But what is the problem? Angela Merkel knows that 85% uh, of the Germans, they don't want to put more money on Greece. So there are elections, and they want, she wants to win elections, so they are not fighting against people. If she would be like Churchill, they would say, well, it doesn't matter if I am losing the elections, I am supporting Europe. And this is really the problem. So one of the feelings that we have in the World Bank is that we have weak political leaders. And I put together Obama, Zapatero, all, all the leaders, Berlusconi, Angela Merkel, and Sarkozy. So we need to think in the medium term as a Europe and not individually. Even if you are losing election, it doesn't matter. And this is a, a big problem, no? because, of course, this is one of the topics that we are suffering. Well, also in the United States, they have a second problem, unemployment. Well, the rate of unemployment is 8%, 8.5%, very low comparing with Spain. However, there is a big difference between Spain and the United States. Traditionally, in Spain, unemployment has been high, 20%, 18 and in the United States, full employment. Full employment is an unemployment of how much? 4%. Remember that it is impossible to have zero unemployment. Why? Because people is moving, uh, moving from regions, from other communities autonomous, or moving from one job. So the minimum rate of unemployment is 4%. And traditionally, in the United States, unemployment has been four. Therefore, full employment. However, after the financial crisis that I mentioned, unemployment is going down, because up, because of the situation of the banks and the companies. And in the United States, they don't have insurance of unemployment. Seguro desempleo. Here in Spain, you have two years. But in the United States, on average, they have three months. So for Americans, having this unemployment is like in Spain, having 35% unemployment. Uh, and uh, there is another problem. Uh, there are, in the United States, 4% that are working part-time, and they like to work full-time. 
So if we add the 8.5 plus the 4% that are working part-time that they, they would like to work full-time, unemployment is higher. Traditionally, politically, in the United States, it is impossible to be reelected to win elections if unemployment exceeds 7%. The only exception has been Ronald Reagan, but all the rest, if unemployment is more than 7%, you, you don't have any possibility because people will take negative. This is why Obama needs to work to reduce unemployment. And the problem is that the United States growth will be only 1%, very, very low, and you need to grow more to, for unemployment to go down. For example, in Spain, do you know how much is the minimum rate of growth for unemployment to go down in Spain? 2%. So unless the Spanish economy will grow more than 2%, unemployment will remember to go down. This is why we are pessimistic. We think that unemployment will go up because unemployment, um, economic growth in Spain would be negative this year and less than 2% in the coming years. This is why the new government should implement new policies to try to encourage economic growth. <coughs> okay, so to finish with the United States. So putting together, the situation is not very good. Some Latin American students ask me, Mario, why the dollar euro is not one, one to one? Because right now, given the fact that Europe is a disaster, Greece, Portugal, Spain, uh, Italy, United States is not very good, but I think that it should be one to one. And my point is that the reason is that the American economy is not doing well, because if United States would have an economic performance like before, let's say be, be, between the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, until the financial crisis, I am sure that the relation would be one by one. But given the fact that in the United States the situation is bad, this is the only reason why we have, you see, a strong euro. Uh, in the World Bank, our forecasting in the medium term, in one year, is that the relationship between the euro and the dollar would be 1.1. So we're expecting in the future that the dollar it will go up and the euro is going down, mainly because of the crisis of Europe. Because if the investors think that in Europe the situation is not very good, the tendency would be to sell uh, euros and buy dollars. But it is very difficult to predict exchange rates. However, the tendency will go basically for the value of the euro to go down or the dollar to go up. OK, let's move to Europe. Well, in Europe, the situation is very bad. And I will talk briefly about the rescue countries. Rescue, what is rescue? When you have problems and investors are losing confidence on the economy, you need to borrow money from the International Monetary Fund and the European Commission to pay lower interest rates. Because the country risk analysis is very high, you need to pay a lot of money to investors. And the only way to avoid paying so much is to give loans from the European Commission and the World Bank. And we have two kinds of countries, Iceland and Ireland. The reason of the crisis has been problems with the banks. And Greece and Portugal, the problem has been, the origin has been governments. In the case of Spain, in my opinion, the solution is not finishing with the euro. It is a disaster thinking that Spain will solve the situation by moving back to the peseta. And from Greece, the same. Why? If we move from the euro to the peseta, all the Spanish debt is in euro. If you depreciate the currency to the peseta, your debt is going up because basically you have a lower currency. So I don't see any advantage of moving to the euro of the peseta and a lot of problems. And basically, it would have capital outflows, a lot of problems like the Corralito. No? So basically, I think that the solution for Spain is not to, to finish with the euro. My opinion is that the solution is not to continue to decline salaries. Some of the owners, managers say, Mario, the only solution is that salaries will go up, down. But right now, the salaries are very low. Remember the expression mileurista, 1,000 euros. Right now, it's 700 euros. Because right now, if you are looking for a job, given that you have a lot of unemployed people with good qualification, they are paying less. So the solution, in my opinion, is not to reduce any more salaries, but the solution is to increase productivity. So that changing the model towards more exports, more tourism, more productivity, try to move the model. So moving the Spanish model that has been based on ladrillo construction towards a model more associated with productivity gains. Of course, this is difficult because you need to make a lot of changes. And uh, later, I will tell you what will be the steps that we should make in order to do, to do so. So briefly, to finish with Europe. So let's begin by Iceland and Ireland. Iceland. Do you know what is the population of Iceland? Yeah, around one quarter million, correctly. Basically, the main activity of Iceland is what? Remember the vikingos, fishery, and also uh, aluminum. It's a big export of aluminum. Uh, well, Iceland, basically, they had only three banks, small country, 
uh, one quarter million, the population. And basically what they did, the banks, was the following. They had public banks, but they sell to the private sector. They sold, so they have private banks. And the business has been to invest in Lehman Brothers, risky investments, futures, and then after Lehman Brothers, they, they finish, they go bankruptcy. And uh, also, uh, the Iceland uh, banks give lo gave loans to the British clients and people from Holland. Why? Because interest rates in United Kingdom has been very low, but very high in uh, Iceland. So a lot of people, half a million British, put the money in Iceland. And when Iceland's banks were bankruptcy, they didn't pay back. So the government on United Kingdom give the money to the, to the British and they are asking the Icelanders to pay. But the Icelanders, which are very strange, they make a referendum. If you, I ask you, do you want to pay your debts? You say, Mario, we, are, we don't like to pay anything. And the referendum say no twice. Therefore, the British are very nervous and they are asking the government of Iceland to pay back. But in the case of Iceland, uh, basically, well, by the way, it's the only country in which the government, the, the president, is in jail because he's in a bad managerial skills. Usually you go to jail if you are taking money and if you go to the justice. But if you are a bad managerial skill, no one goes to jail. But in Iceland, which are, is an strange uh, country with a lot of democratic uh, uh, assets, he's uh, in jail right now because of the, these uh, problems. But he's under investigation and the big possibility to be in jail. Okay, so in, in Iceland, basically the situation is better. They devaluate the currency, they are exporting, they are doing well, but they didn't solve the money by helping the banks. So the banks didn't receive any money from the government, and basically they have a lot of losses. But the situation is doing better. Ireland, remember what is the population of Ireland, Irlanda? Five, uh, five million people. Uh, we call Ireland the big success of Europe. Remember that Ireland in the 70s was very poor. And suddenly, in a pim pam pum way, he had spectacular economic growth. And they moved from very poor to very rich from the 70s to the 90s. And, uh, well, we will discuss later why, but right now they have a big crisis. Also, they have three banks. The big reason why the banks were going bankruptcy in Ireland has been mortgage. The price of housing has going down and all the banks close with big losses. But in the case of Ireland, the government made a big mistake. What has been the mistake? With the money of the taxpayers, they solved the banks. So the fiscal deficit in Ireland was 7% of GDP. And after that, the government took the decision with the money of the taxpayers to, to pay to the banks, the deficit was moving from 7% of GDP until 23%, which is a disaster, because we cannot pay with our taxes if the banks made mistakes. However. Ireland has been receiving money from the International Monetary Fund and the European Commission, and both Iceland and Ireland are doing better. Right now, they are doing very well, not very well, but they are improving the situation. So when the problem has been associated with the banks, the situation is doing better. However, Greece and Portugal, a disaster. Let me be, give you, a, I am very pessimistic about Greece and Portugal, and I am optimistic on Spain in the medium term. Let me explain why in the medium term. Medium term means, Año 7000 después de Cristo. No. <laughs> Before that, I mean, not in the short term. In the medium term, why? In Spain, we have one asset. Uh, we have industry, especially in the north part of Spain. Uh, we have potential to export, even though we are not exporting right now. If we apply good policies, we will discuss these policies today. We have the possibility to export. And also, we have companies that are leaders in international markets, such as banks, Santander and BBVA. Even with the problems, they are considered leaders in international markets. We have other sectors, Alta Velocidad, highways, that we are leaders in the world, selling technology to USA, Saudi Arabia. Well, in Europe, we are famous about all the engineers. We have good engineers, generally speaking, in Spain. Then we have leaders in energy, it's mainly uh, energy associated with, you see, what kind of energy we are, good companies. <coughs> Basically, eolic, with the wind, and also from the sun. In these two sectors, we have very good companies, Avengoa, Iberdrola, Renovables, whatever. And then in infrastructure, we are very strong. On the 10 most important multinational companies on infrastructure, engineers, constructions, water supply, Spain has six of the 10 most important in the world. Therefore, we have chicha, substance, where is the beef, to be rich. Portugal and Greece, no, we have zero productivity. According <laughs> with the World Bank in the last century, what has been the productivity? Very low, because they don't export, they don't have industry, they don't have important companies. So really, 
in, especially in the case of Greece, I don't know if it has been a good idea to decide to include Greece in the, in the Euro, in the European Commission. Perhaps it has to do with political reasons, because Greece is, of course, the basis of our cultural values, the philosophers, the democratic values, and this has been a reason. But from the point of view of, you see, economic side, it has been really a mistake. And the problem of Portugal and Greece is that they have huge deficits. In the case of Greece, the situation is very bad. Why? Because they are not collecting money. The situation is very, very, very bad. And they are not taking actions. They need to sell privatized companies, and they are not doing so. Uh, and we have a quita, a reduction of the debt of 50%, 50%. What? what well, tourism is the, is the opportunity, really. But uh, really, you, tourism could help, but could not be the only basis for economic growth. So my point is, in Spain, tourism could be helping to, to improve exports and tourism. But the, really, the, the help should be, you see, having some advantages with multinational companies in all the sectors that I mentioned. But tourism alone cannot be uh, aggregated value productivity to, to have which could help, but not the, the basis. So industry, exports, uh, multinational companies, this would be the basis for productivity gains and trying economic progress. Yes, of course, tourism is, is the, the only asset of, of Greece, basically. But it's not sufficient because of the, of the debt. Therefore, to, to summarize this, the European situation, right now the situation is very bad. situation of Greece and Portugal is really critical. And right now we have uh, Spain, Spain and Italy. So Spain is not possible to rescue Spain. Why? Because it's a big country for economy in Europe. Number one, Germany, France, Italy, Spain. So we need to make the homework. We need to reduce expenditures to have confidence of investors. But I am optimistic, eh, to be frank with you, that with the changes in Italy and Spain, we can make the homework. However, even if we have Superman as a prime minister or president, the situation would be bad anyway, because the situation is a lot of perfect storm, tormenta perfecta. So we'll have a lot of things. Even with Superman, the situation would be bad. But uh, most of the markets in the medium term, I think that they will be very positive about the changes. So I, I expect that Spain and Italy will improve, but in the medium term, not in the short term. In the short term, the situation would be difficult anyway. So Europe as a whole is having difficulties, and this is the problem. OK, to finish with this first part of the conference, I will talk about Japan, which is the last part. Well, Japan, the situation is very bad. Well, after the Second World War, we have two superpowers, Germany and Japan. <coughs> and Japan did very well recovering from the World Bank. However, the problems of Japan began in the 90s. They have a bubble in the property sector. The price of housing in Tokyo was going down sharply. And basically what happened is that a lot of, the, a lot of banks and construction companies were having big losses. And uh, also, in Japan, they have one problem. Inflation is negative. It's the only country in the world in which prices are going down. We economists like when inflation is very low. For example, the ideal rate of inflation is 1%, 2%. But what happened, the question to you, if I tell you, in Madrid, prices will go down, minus 4%. Why it is bad for economists that prices are going down? Correctly. Basically, if you are a consumer, you say, Mario, if prices are going down, I, I wait. I'm not spending. I wait later. I will buy in a few months. But if all of us are stopping making consumption and waiting, consumption will go down. Uh, taking into consideration that in Spain, consumption represents 63% of GDP, of, of production. It's the basis of the economy. So if all of us are waiting, the economy will have a recession. Recession is when economic growth is going down during six consecutive months. And in Japan, it's the only country in which inflation was going negative and consumption was very, very low. So if you analyze the numbers of Japan in terms of economic growth, it has been negative in the last, or very low in the last years. This is one problem. Second problem, demographic trends. In Japan, uh, they, they, have, they live longer, like in Spain. You know that in Spain we live longer than... The, the Europeans. Why we live longer in Spain than in Europe? Do you have some theory? In addition to the Fiesta Pachanga party? Well, perhaps it has to do with the Mediterranean diet, olives, wine, whatever. Or perhaps it has to do with the fact that we don't have a lot of stress. According with the sociologists of the World Bank, Españolito de pie, our citizen, they don't have stress. This is not your case, I suppose. But uh, if you don't have a stress, you don't have a cancer, no heart attacks. This could be the reason. 
In terms of smoking and drinking alcohol, we are like the Europeans, we are abusing. But the only theory, it's a mystery, but in my opinion, perhaps the only explanation would be that we don't have a lot of stress or we live longer. So, of course, in the case of Japanese, they, they live longer and they have a problem. They have a scarcity of young people and a lot of old people, which is bad to pay the pensions, number one, and second, in terms of productivity, because for productivity gains, it's better to have the opposite, basically, young people working with education and uh, not a lot of <coughs> old people. So they have demographic problems. And also they have another problem. China is very close. You see, China is at the same time an opportunity and a problem. For example, if I ask you the following question, in Spain, do you consider that China has been opportunity or a problem to make business? Well, in the past, some people considered that it has been a problem. Why? Because we have been hurt by a lot of imports. By the way, what are the sectors? that Chinese are selling in Spain, what sectors they are competing with our production. Correctly, textile, shoes, furniture, um, so, uh, some kinds of electronics, and uh, so until now really we have a lot of imports from China and we are not exporting to China. We expect to export soon, but right now basically we, are not, we export to Germany, to France, but not to China. But in the future, China will be an opportunity. First, because tourists will come here in a very important way, spending money and creating jobs. Second, uh, because they are buying bonds. As you know, Spain is paying the debt, and 22% of our bonds are, are bought by Chinese government, so they are helping to finance our fiscal deficit. And then, because we have a lot of projects to export and make business in China. For example, I have a lot of seminars with some people in Spain, small companies, PYMES, and when you ask people what will be the markets, geographical markets for the future to make business in exporting or investing, China is number one. Number two, India, Brazil number three. So even though right now we don't have business, all the companies, even small, have a lot of expectation. Uh, Latin America, for Latin America, China is an opportunity or a problem? Well, it depends what country. If you talk about the southest part of Latin America, from Colombia to the south, opportunity. Why? Because they make a lot of business with uh, China, they export, prices are going up, they are very happy with China. Mexico, no, because Mexico considers China as a competitor, and Central American countries, they basically make business with the United States, so China is not important. But from Colombia to the south, China is very good, they are helping to recover, Mexico is uh, no, and it depends. United States, what do you think? China is a competitor or opportunity? Well, in United States, they have problems with China. One of the reasons is that the exchange, what is the currency of China? Moneda China? Yuan or Raminbi, they have two names, Yuan or Raminbi. And as you know, it's a very weak currency. But this is weak, not because of the market, not of the supply and demand, because the government of China, the central bank, are intervening, buying and selling, to allow the, the currency to go down. Why? If the currency is uh, weak, you can export very easily because it's cheaper. So there are some critics to China government, stop making a speculation and allow the fo market forces to determine, you see, the relation like the euro and the dollar. <coughs> so in United States, most of the people, they, they see China as a competitor and you see China <coughs> is not very popular. But in the case of Japan, China is a big competitor. Why? Because it's very close geographically, and they are losing a lot of business. For example, the salaries of China are very low. Why? Because of social purposes. In China, they work 11 hours, they sleep in the factories, and they continue to work. And the salaries are very low. We call this social dumping, the fact that salaries are very low. As Michael Porter said, they have a competitive advantage in salaries. But in Japan, as you know, salaries are very, very high. Therefore, it is difficult to compete and China will steal a lot of business. So in summary, on Japan we are very pessimistic and on the industrial countries is really the country that is having really very bad results. Okay, to finish the, this introduction, this first part, I would like to summarize the main conclusions. So the world economy is divided in two parts. While developing countries are doing very well and we are very optimistic in the future, mainly Asia and Latin America, we are having big problems in industrial countries. And really, a few months ago, Lula, the former president of Brazil, was visiting Portugal. And he was saying, well, Brazil, I will talk with Dilma Rousseff, the president, to ask a Brazilian to buy 
the Portuguese debt. We are helping Portugal, making some jokes. Well, Portugal would be a colony of Brazil soon. Well, so this is an anecdote, a joke, really. But it, it gives you the idea of what is happening. In Spain, we look at Latin America saying, well, they are our sons with some superiority. But right now, it's the other way around. Really, a lot of Spanish are going to Latin America to work, or even the Brazilian government is thinking, well, perhaps we are helping Spain by involved. So really, traditionally, we saw developing countries, you see, in a low level. But right now, we have a change. Shadow Vuelta la Tortilla, as we said in Spanish. And developing countries are doing better. And even though it is difficult for us to understand this, this is a tendency on the world economy. But really, uh, however, even though we are expecting that the United States and Europe will have difficulties, uh, we are optimistic in the medium term. In the short term, we have problems with Greece, Portugal, Spain. But we think that in the medium term, Europe and United States will improve. And however, the best economic performance in the world would be in Asia and Latin America. OK, with this, we finish the first part. And we, before making a, a, some in, in break, I don't know if you want to make questions on this first part of the class about international economy. L then we will talk about other topics, of course. OK, let's make a small break of five minutes, and then we continue. OK, okay thank you. OK, good. Thank <laughs> you.